You didn't even ask if I was ready. It's already started, Ben. What if I wasn't ready? Well, I was you know, I'm on Facebook too. Well, Brian, you're always ready. We need like a order. countdown. We need a three, two, something, Ben, to prepare right. everybody. Because now we've got people watching and our banter, and it doesn't even make any sense. We do you want me? Do you want me to do a countdown now, or is it yeah, too late? Countdown now, please. Okay. From five. Go ahead. Three, two, one. <laughs> That's from five. No, I don't do from five. We're talking about education and homes. You've got to lead by example here, Ben. It's not setting a good picture for our children. Well, welcome everyone to another edition of WCM Fireside Chats. Uh, we have a pretty uh, full list of guests today. Um, uh, they're going to be joining us. We're going to be talking about virtual learning, education, how things have changed due to the due to the COVID nineteen crisis, and. Um, how it could impact your park because i mean realistically if more kids are doing virtual learning or some sort of homeschooling then you could potentially have family or you know families looking to do some different things during the week than maybe what was normal that's cool ben's freezing at random intervals there we go <laughs> can you see me now yeah, yeah i think it makes you sound better if you freeze randomly so just continue yeah, I know, I know. Well, anyways, we have uh, Kimberly Wooten, uh, Wooten um, from, uh, she is a founder of Right Coast Creatives, um, which is a marketing firm located in the East Coast. Which state is that located in, Kimberly? We're in Delaware. Delaware, okay, all right. And then uh, we have Greg Emmert, who is co-owner and manager of Homerville Campgrounds of America in Homerville, Ohio. And uh, his family has owned that park for 20 plus years. And um, how many sites did you say you had again, Greg? 225. 225, all right, okay. And then we also have Brittany Hollifield, who is a full-time road schooler. She used to be a school teacher. How long have you been? Uh, so a road schooler for people who don't know is basically a homeschooler who lives full-time in an RV or RVs for a majority of the year. Um, uh, so I guess, Brittany, how long have you been doing that? I've been doing it for a year and a half now. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So I guess what we wanted to, and then of course we have Brian Searle from Insider Perks, who's our, one of our co-hosts, and Kara from the Canadian RV Council, <laughs> Canadian RV and Camping Council. Um, and you, you get her last name wrong, and now you got the whole organization wrong? I, I, hey, I my na name off this time just don't even bother going there no <laughs> no yeah and, and then, then we have, and then we have ben quiegel from yeah. walls campground management I think that's how you pronounce <laughs> pretty much so uh but i guess you know what we, really, we wanted to talk about was virtual learning and how you could potentially see more school-aged kids at your park and i guess kimberly just to start off with you i know you have been working, you worked with some parks on marketing some of this stuff during the spring, I believe, and you're also doing some stuff now, I guess. Give us a picture as to what you're kind of working on. Well, so Kimberly, before you do that, tell us about Right Cross Creative because it's a newer company, right, in the campground space. So just tell us real quick what you do so people have an idea, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, first of all, thanks for having me. Excited to join you guys this morning. Um, so we started Ray Coast Creatives um, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, um, and we focus on uh, marketing, camp store solutions, and revenue management for the outdoor hospitality industry. Um, we also have an operational division as well, if you're looking for a full kind of hospitality management company. So we can kind of do it all for the outdoor hospitality folks. Um, so some of the things we've been working on, so in the spring, as we, we started seeing delays in, um, um, you know, kind of the camping environment, getting back and going, one of the things we wanted to focus on was, um, you know, we, we focused on homeschoolers, actually. And so we did a whole initiative about homeschool at camp, and each of our campgrounds selected specific weeks. And uh, we designated that as homeschool at camp week and our activities teams came up with specific events and activities for 
all of the kids joining us and um, we, we pretty much sold out our parks during those designated weeks. Um, so now thinking about going into the fall and having that many more people, distance learning and homeschooling, I think it's a great opportunity to really look at your business um, from a midweek perspective, because it's always the opportunity is how do you feel midweek, um, especially as you move into the fall. And so really connecting with homeschoolers and distance learners is a great opportunity to fill your campground, number one, but then give parents a break, give them something different to do with their kids during the week instead of being at home, because that's challenge enough. Um, so now they can, you know, come to camp, they can play with other kids, still get their learning done, but be in an environment which allows the parents a little bit of time to relax because there are other things to keep the kids entertained besides them. So that's really what we've been focusing on as we've been moving into the fall with a lot of our campgrounds looking for opportunity weeks um, to really designate as, you know, um, school at camp week and um, you know, reaching out to existing guests and putting a whole marketing campaign behind that. Are there parks? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Kira. Go ahead. I was just going to ask if parks are offering discounting and then what those activities look like. So some of our parks do offer a discount. Um, one of our parks in Canada is offering 10% off if they stay all four nights of the week, um, just as a little extra incentive. Um, some of our campgrounds um, actually ha have been incentivizing in other ways. So obviously, Wi-Fi <laughs> is a huge component of the success of this because with distance learning, obviously, Wi-Fi is even more so important on your campground. Um, and a lot of our clients have, um, you know, free Wi-Fi for guests, but you can also pay to upgrade your Wi-Fi to high-speed internet. Um, so one of the things we've been offering instead of doing a discount on your stay is we are including high speed internet at that site if they book the school at camp week, um, just to guarantee that they have the uh, resources needed in order to continue their learning, but still have a great time. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I guess, you know, when I was talking to some park owners about this show, um, some of them were a little concerned about the high speed internet portion of it. Are you, you know, do, so are most of the parks you're working with all have the internet capability for the virtual learning then, or? All except for one. And, and I think they have learned really quickly this summer how important that investment is. So um, for the park owners out there, I, I know we, we, I hear it constantly. Um, but I, I think now more so than ever, um, really investing in reliable, consistent Wi-Fi is, is so, so critical to the success of the property. I know me personally, I travel all the time for work. I'm an avid camper. And so I work remotely and I, I really have to be selective about where I stay based on the Wi-Fi service. So I think, you know, even more so now with so many people on the road and obviously the RV industry is booming. Um, as you plan your capital expenditures for next year, um, if Wi-Fi is something you have been considering, I would highly recommend it. <laughs> Kimberly, what do you think the catalyst is for Wi-Fi at these park owners who stubbornly have refused, despite like hundreds of Arvit classes and KOA classes and everything else, <laughs> articles that Ben's written and, you know, the importance of Wi-Fi and, you know, just walking out in public and seeing that people are actually carrying technology around that uses this stuff. What is the catalyst that actually gets the rest of these people to, to upgrade? You know, what's interesting, um, and, and so I have a real, kind of real life scenario. So we, we, we took over with a park um, earlier this spring that was newly renovated, but they did not invest in Wi-Fi. And, you know, in a, in a very saturated market, mind you. So there were, there's multiple options in that area for people to camp. And right off the bat, the, the first, um, you know, probably 10 reviews were all about the Wi-Fi. And, you know, that obviously, you know, reviews play a huge role in a, a buyer's decision. So right off the bat, that was the perspective of that campground from campers, which really helped deter um, other campers. So I, I think, um, you know, 
what really moves that needle is when they start seeing, you know, business go to other campgrounds, you know, and it, it starts hitting their wallet for sure. When they start seeing um, that come up in reviews, that's a really kind of black and white example of here's customer feedback. Um, so those two things kind of worked for that campground and they are now like in the process of upgrading their Wi-Fi as we speak to get ready for the fall because they do have a, a they're around campground so um it makes sense but, for, i mean because you see all the data you hear all the classes but until it really hits you in your pocketbook and you can see here's numbers that are declining it doesn't really yeah and it, it would yeah it, it definitely kind of hit them hard you know and it's one of those things that I, I think a lot of campground owners really look at camping and you know obviously the industry is involved especially over the past five years but looked at camping as a retreat. It's your time to disconnect. And, and that's great. And, you know, we absolutely, I mean, that's part of why I go camping, but you have to give people who want to connect the option to do so on a reliable network. Um, there's so much that goes on that's based on, you know, Wi-Fi that you can't not have it at this point. Well, and we're talking about homeschooling and all that stuff, which is critical. So Brittany yeah. is at the KOA in Montana, right? Brittany, you yeah. wrote school. Tell us how critical, before we shift to the other things, but tell us how critical Wi-Fi is to, to you and where you decide. Okay, so um, I kind of live like two lifestyles, I would say. Um, my husband works um, away for a month and he's home for a month. So when okay. he is away... And we are in a campground stationary for a month. I look for very different things than I look for in the month that he's home and we're traveling and bouncing around. Because when he is gone, I'm looking for safety. I'm looking for the Wi-Fi. I'm looking for all these different amenities as opposed to when we're traveling and bouncing and staying someplace three or four or five days, the Wi-Fi isn't as important. So I'm, I would say I'm looking for different things depending on this, which month it is. How, do you, go ahead, Ben. Do you use, you know, how important is the Wi-Fi to what you do educationally with your kids? Okay, so before we took the leap, I decided that I was not going to go with online because I wasn't sure and I wasn't confident in the Wi-Fi everywhere. So we are book curriculum because I just don't want to trust it and be like, oh, hey, we don't do school this month. That would not be okay. So I have bought almost all book and, um, yeah. Because it was just too iffy. Okay. All right. I, I think, Kimberly, you know, with the activities you mentioned, I mean, that's really neat, you know, that the parks are taking the time to do something like that. Because you know, even with the virtual learning, so like when my kids were doing virtual learning in the spring, they can do everything for the school online. And, but, you know, it's great to be able to get them out of the you know house and be able to do maybe some educational stuff or activities where they engage with other people because I know a lot of kids you know are looking for that engagement that's what they miss the most from school I guess yeah and and so our, our teams our recreation teams did a really really great job of, of kind of thinking outside the box of how they can really engage kids still keeping it you know centrally focused around you know, the main subjects within school. So um, what they've done for the fall is, you know, Monday is, is science, Tuesday is math, Thursday, you know, Wednesday. So they've picked a different subject each day to focus on and all of the activities are built around that subject. So um, whether it's making slime or, you know, they, they have a ton of activities. I don't even know. Um, it's, it's, it, they've gotten really creative with it and the parents love it because they're still learning. It's still applicable to a lot of what they're doing in school. Um, and it's fun and it entertains the kids. And um, one of our campgrounds, because they have such a large homeschool population, um, uh, they're in New Hampshire, um, they even separated um, all of the kids sort of by elementary school, middle school and high school and really geared the activities toward that specific age group. They got really um, you know, particular about the activities they plan based on age to ensure that everybody was, um, you know, appropriately entertained. <laughs> and, and you're a marketer, so, and Brian Thrill is too. I mean, I guess I just imagine. Oh I'm just, I pretend. I'm no, not really, yeah, he pretends. 
but I guess, you know, this is just kind of like, you know, really easy stuff to market, I imagine. I mean, like, you're doing all these activities, you've got, the, you know, I imagine for looking at doing some of this stuff during the fall. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, it kind of makes my job pretty easy. <laughs> Send out some emails, um, you know, you know, one of the things I've worked on with a lot of my campgrounds who we do email marketing for is really um, segmenting their database appropriately. And so um, we, in gearing up for this, we, we did a big database download. We went back and resegmented their database to make sure we captured all of their current customers. And we've been able to filter and really target families with kids in all of this marketing. Um, it's also easy to do that with our um, social ads as well. So we really get a, a highly focused market of people that we are targeting um, and our results are, are even better when it comes to reservations. So, I guess I, oh, go ahead, Brian. I just want to involve Greg because he looks really lonely in the corner. Yeah, I know, he looks lonely. And I feel like he should, so. I was just going to ask, Greg owns KOA in Ohio, obviously we introduced him. Greg, what are some of the things like you think, we've talked about homeschooling, we've talked about obviously there's curriculum, and even if we do virtual schooling, there's going to be parents who have to follow certain standards that their state and cities and government set forth as far as what they can learn and what they have to test. Yeah, but just being from a pure campground perspective, what are some of the things that you feel like are tools that a camp, any campground would offer as a learning experience to a child? Not even necessarily with planned activities, just in general, let's start there. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, anything you can do to take care of your, like, natural surroundings, right, and have even just some small green spaces. I know a lot of parks that I talk to, I'm like, well, I stopped mowing, you know, 30 acres and turned it into these trails, and they're like, I my park's five acres. What, what, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, I can't do that. Y you could plant small patches of native plants. You could plant milkweeds and use it as a small outdoor classroom to teach kids about the life cycle of butterflies. You, you can do that with four milkweed plants if you're in the eastern part of the country. Um, you know, there's always opportunity. It's just a matter of finding that spot at your park and what you can do with it. But, you, th you know, think of your, your park, of your space as a classroom. I mean, just being outdoors, it's, it's educational in and of itself. Um, so that does take some help from the parents. Obviously, the parents have to be able to see that. So maybe you need to provide, a, um, you know, there's different programs you can do with uh, setting up backpacks, right? So you could have one backpack set up for entomology and give a kid a little plastic jar and a net. There, I don't, I've never met a, a kid that didn't want to catch a bug and put it in a, in a jug and check it out, right? So you could have different backpacks for different adventures, right, for your day. And you could give those out to people who are doing homeschooling. But, um, you know, those are just suggestions, but we, everything we do here is very informal. We don't do any formal education because I'm not, I'm not an educator. I just like to share the things that we have here in the park. And uh, I'm fortunate to, to have some, some family and friends. My wife is, a, is an outdoor educator, so I can sort of suck off her database a little bit and get some ideas for how to educate people at the park here. But everything we do is really informal. I just, I try to look at the park itself as a classroom. So what I've got a creek, I've got a meadow, I've got, there's all kinds of different lessons you can teach with each one of those things. And like I say, even for the park owners that don't have that much, you could, a few plantings and you've got activities galore. Well, I think that's what we're really looking for is to try to kind of spark some conversation because as we move yeah. toward potentially more virtual learning, well, yeah, you have your curriculum that, that you have to follow. If it can be enhanced to the campground, there's a lot of these owners who haven't done the activities like Kimberly was saying yet or maybe you don't have the staff necessary to do that. And so utilizing the things that are on the campground that require less of an investment, less of the time, less planning, I think are, are some key things that are easy for people to deploy, right? Absolutely, yeah, use your natural features. And if you don't have any, make some there. It's generally very cost effective to you know, plant a small patch of local plants and teach kids about pollinating. You don't have to really do much. You just plant it and let it happen after that. So. Um, yeah, outdoor education is, is great. And I think it's going to be a huge part of this because more and more people realize that, you know, the, uh, the phrase nature deficit disorder, um, that I, I think that's a real thing. Uh, we, we don't get outside enough. Outside 
is it's a tactile learning process. You touch things and the more your senses you employ, of course, the better you remember things, the better you learn, the happier you are in general. So um, yeah, I think parks that will adopt some of that and, uh, and embrace it, I, I think the, the sky's the limit really. Brittany, is there anything that stands out to you as you've traveled across the, the country just that parks have done that really just wow you? Um, I can't say that we've been to a lot that have offered any kind of thing like that, but kind of going off of what Greg was saying, um, you've got a wide range of homeschoolers. There's different categories, so not everyone um, is using books and things like that. There's a huge group of unschoolers, and they're actually on the road. One of the things, like Greg said, is just incredible because he's talking about using the space you have. It's so true. Um, there's nature learners out there. There's unschoolers, and they don't use all the curriculum. You don't have to have all of that. So I absolutely love what he was saying. Um, but as I haven't really come across anything going off what Kimberly was saying. Having those things would be amazing, especially for the months when we are stationary, to have that break incredible <laughs> so i like um where they're both going that you can have the option of some campgrounds for the unschoolers and nature studies and things like that and then some more organized stuff i just need to know where to find these campgrounds because i didn't know they existed <laughs> that would be one one four five zero crawford <laughs> road wow. right. i wrote homerville already i've got it down in my notebook <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I do think this is kind of a unique environment where campgrounds could really potentially make these pretty small pivots and and really access a new kind of segment of the market that they maybe haven't been uh, targeting in the past. Um, and certainly, I mean, up here in Canada with the with the weather the way it is, we're limited in terms of how long we can operate for, but definitely would have a huge impact on those shoulder seasons, you know, March, April, September, October, into November even, um, that are usually, I mean, they're usually seeing 50 or 60% capacities and maybe, you know, bumping those up with everybody staying at home with some cool activities and stuff like that. I, I really, I'm excited to see some campgrounds take this stuff on. But I agree with Brittany. I think there's a, there's going to be a hurdle uh, uh, in place for them about getting the information out there and and letting people know it's available. I mean, it's because it's so new and different. I, uh, you know, I've talked with some campground. I know obviously as a campground owner, Greg probably knows this, you know, you, you're already busy and you, you know, when you talk about some of this stuff, you're adding on more responsibilities. I guess part of that, uh, Greg, what you're talking about really is kind of simple almost. You're just taking what's already there and turning it into kind of a, an activity, I guess, um, you know, that that's not going to take a lot of time, I guess. It's just the initial investment of, of maybe putting information together. Yeah, absolutely. And it, for us, it was hard to, um, you know, we're a, a seasonal or long-term camper heavy park. Um, we're starting to transition to a little more overnight camping, which is great. Um, but the, it, it took a long time. Those folks, a lot of times they're here for a long time. And they have an idea of what the park is, you know, and you're like, well, I'm going to change the way this, this area is managed. We're going to turn it into fields. And they're like, ah, oh, keep camping, make camping great again. I'm like, no, 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 we can't, we got to get away from that. We're going to try something new, you know, and, and it was hard to change that culture. But now some of the people that, that griped about it at the beginning, I see they're walking their dogs on the trails and I'm like, well, you know, look who uh, came around there finally, you know, so and that feels really good. But it definitely getting the message out has been really hard for us. More and more we're attracting people that I, I've been trying to do more on social media and get the idea out there that this is a great place to come to enjoy nature because there, there are a lot of people that that do this anyway and um, I think it was Kara who mentioned um, about how many people were out there doing this but if you look at like so I'm just going back to a, a, a talk that I did at Arvik last year, 86 million US residents, that's 34% of the population, this is pre-pandemic, they took wildlife watching trips, mm -hmm. a third of the population, which that, that's insane. Now they spent more money, first of all, that, that's more people than NASCAR, the Grand Canyon, NFL and Disney World all drew in a year, okay? They spent, 
um, we're looking at $41.9 billion on what the feds called special equipment. That's campers, boats. They spent um, one and a half, no, 6.1 billion, I'm sorry, on food and lodging. Well, that's camping, folks. So, I mean, this, these people were always out there and they're the folks that, um, that I'm trying to reach, but now it's, it's gotten even more into education because of the pandemic. So if, you know, parks like mine, I feel like I'm in a great spot because people can go out, they can hit a trail, they're distanced from other folks. The trail is the classroom. Um, I just, I need more campground owners to drink my Kool-Aid and I'm, I'm working on that too, but um, so it's, but yeah. it's wildlife watching is what you're saying. So really what you're, what you're advising campgrounders to do is find a way to get more bears into their campground and things like that. Yes. Bad dumpster and trash practices are gold mines. Absolutely. Yes. Makes perfect sense. It does. Opportunities. Only a Northeast Ohioan would come back with that, Brian. Thank you. If you, if you see a bear in Northeast Ohio, that would be pretty incredible. Why it's not? a big, it, it'd be a huge deal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the rates you could charge every night. Yeah. Come from all over the place. That's right. Yeah. We have dynamic pricing for, uh, when the bear occupancy is high. <laughs> we use the pricing. They yeah. probably come from Indiana to see bears, I bet. Wouldn't they? They would. The bears, the bears come over from, when they do come over, they come over from Pennsylvania to see humans. Um, they do it for free, which I think is awful. We should be taxing that. And then uh, they go back when the, the breeding season's over generally, yeah. I bet you, though, a lot of bears homeschool their cubs. So. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, without question. And there we are with that uh, scenario. I was waiting. <laughs> Just come. We can't help it. All right, so... Um, oh, it's a bear. It's always a bear. <laughs> I can change it up next week if you're bored of bears. There, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to disappoint you. Yeah. Um, High standards, I guess. That's good because somebody's got to have them because Quiggle doesn't. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. so, so Greg was saying about some of these uh, the the nature and, the, and that's I think what we're kind of going for here is a way for people to get into this um, more easily. So, Kimberly, do you have some suggestions? Maybe you could give campground owners who have you know, gardens or nature trails or things like that, that where they could create maybe, not necessarily activities, because maybe not everybody has the staff to do that, right? But maybe printouts or handouts or features in their apps or things like that that would help people take advantage of those and self-guide. Yeah, absolutely. And we do have campgrounds that we work with that don't have the staff. I mean, it's really the owners and that's it. So one of the things we have done for them is um, so scavenger hunts are really popular. You can do a one sheeter. Um, we have we have one property that is that has a lot of nature around them. They have a walking trail and there's a lot of wildlife. So we put together a scavenger hunt of here's some animals you might see. And um, as they see each of those animals, they can cross them off, bring them back to the office and get a prize. Um, we put together, like even in, in our guest guide, um, we included, here's some animals you're gonna see on property, um, just really to educate the guests and really take advantage of the nature driven um, land that the campground is on. Um, and so, I mean, it, it, you don't have to reward them in any way, but really just educating them about the nature around them. Um, some of the walking trails at one of the campgrounds, um, they put together, story time. So like there's different spots within the walking trail, different markers, and there's a book about, you know, nature or the area, <clears throat> excuse me, for the kids to read or even adults, because some of them are really interesting, actually. Um, so it was more of like a book trail. Um, there's a lot you can do with what you have without spending a lot of money or uh, requiring a lot of, you know, time or, or staff. So when you're putting together one of these scavenger hunts, is there kind of a guidance as to what you should include and not include when people are like, let's say I'm a campground in New Mexico and I've got giant fuzzy tarantulas that cling to the side of my cabins. Should you put this in the scavenger hunt or should you just look for birds that are native to the area instead? Yeah, we, we did have to filter. Okay. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, this is, this is where we, we really do partner with our campgrounds and, and kind of rely on our owners to give us some guidance as to what to include <laughs> not to include um you know they're they, they're near the water so there were a lot of jellyfish we're like okay let's 
we're not going to go there. We don't want them getting in the water. Um, so yeah, we have to filter. You have to use some common sense. Um, but it, it is pretty interesting. And, you know, in, you know, in the, the guides that we put together about the animals that they can see on the campground, we put a little picture of the animal so they can okay. easily identify it. And then a little blurb about the animal, just educating them. Um, we also have, um, a plants and trees version as well. So, you know, based on the seasonality, the animals aren't always available <laughs> or around, um, you know. So we did put together trees and um, then they, they have a butterfly garden, fortunately, so we put a butterfly version together. So it's a really, really, really nature-based campground. Um, and there's, there's really few other activities on site other than nature. So we really, leverage that and kind of made some made some fun activities around that. So if I'm an if I'm an owner trying to put one of these lists together um, and I've never done it before but I want to try to attract either homeschoolers or virtual learners, what do you think is kind of the time investment involved to do just the basic of the trees and the wildlife? So really it, it was for us, it, it, you know, especially it was it was just a few hours. You know, we we hopped on Google, looked at, you know, some of the the descriptions for the trees and the animals in the area. Um, got a list from the campground owners. Of, here's some things you can definitely expect to see, and here's some things that are indigenous to our area. Um, and then, you know, put a, put a one cheater together. And again, the one cheater doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be professionally printed. It doesn't necessarily need to be beautifully graphically designed. You know, um, I think campers are happy to just get that and, and kind of share that passion about what's going on at your campground. So, um, you know, we created really easy um, Word documents for them to be able to use on site. Um, well, for us, we did a little bit more sophisticated <laughs> Word document, but it can be that simple. You plop in a picture, you plop in a description, you give them some direction, um, and they're good to go. Did you do any of this, Kara? Sorry, Ben, go ahead. Now, do you, like, are you giving, now, I imagine there's ways that you can do this and not give like a little prize or something, but I imagine there's a way that you could do like a scavenger hunt or something um, and give a prize, maybe something small. Yeah, you can take the tarantula home with you. Take the tarantula home. <laughs> take that candy, it doesn't cost that much, huh? Okay. <laughs> give it to sucker and you're good. Kids like it. Yeah. Yep, an ice cream, yeah. stickers. Yeah, yeah, things that yeah. are low cost or, or low margin, right, that, that you can give away. Yep don't cost that much money so I was going to ask Kara did you ever do any of this at your campground when you owned it um well I mean I would say I had a little bit more limitation in terms of space than maybe someone like Greg in in back in those days but um I we did have kind of a little fishing hole on site and so we did lots of fun unique little things with that I mean life cycle of tadpoles and <laughs> frogs and and obviously you know tons of insects and all those kinds of things but um yeah I, I think I mean it's been a few years since I owned a park but um the the desire for that kind of access to nature and stuff is is um probably magnified right now maybe not maybe I'm maybe I'm reaching but um I agree I think I agree yeah yeah I think I think there's this intense kind of desire to just be outside and and all of those things right now that's really going to translate to good engagement and stuff like that that was kind of our, my biggest hurdle in in those days was just you know getting more than two or three kids out which I mean, always was fine anyway, but those, those activities were always fun when you had six or eight of them and, and, the, you know, it was a little bit competitive to uh, maybe win the prizes and, and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't see engagement being an issue in, in this type of environment. Now, Greg, you do, um, so the nature stuff that you do, you kind of take, you kind of guide those groups yourself right so there's potential like if an owner feels comfortable or has the knowledge to be able just to take groups out and do um something in person i guess yeah absolutely um i make it a point to just make the time to do those activities on our schedule uh, because i enjoy it 
Um, and it's, you know, we go everything from stuff that is a little more staff uh, heavy, uh, different than what Kimberly was talking about. But at the same time, we do things like, like she mentioned as well that are a little less staff heavy. I mean, we go from, um, so early in the year around Arbor Day, we'll do a tree planting. We do a few different hikes throughout the year that, uh, that I lead. Um, and they're, they're kind of seasonally dependent. So in the spring, uh, birds are migrating through here and I'm, I'm a bird nerd, so we take them on a bird hike. And in the summer, we do a, a, a water survey in the creek. Um, we've done one for wild edibles, although that turned into something that was a little different. Uh, that's a joke, that's just kidding. But it's actually, we did wild edibles, wildflowers when that starts going. And our, uh, our best one was the, the night chorus. And this is one that um, I think people can take advantage of. It's really well suited for camping because it plays on the sounds you're hearing around the campfire, right? What makes the campfire great? All those background sounds and fireflies. And so we do a, a nighttime walk. We set up a, a lamp to bring in moths and have a big sheet out and we can check the moths out. Very nerdy, but people love it. Last time I think we had 30 some people for that. Um, but then you can get into the things that aren't as labor intensive. Um, like we, we have an astronomer who brings his telescope out and I don't, I bring him a couple of Mountain Dews and the guy is jazzed to teach the campers about the universe. Almost everywhere has an astronomy club or society, whether it be in your state or your county, those guys love to haul their telescopes out and go look at how cool this is. And let me show you Betelgeuse and the, you know, the Crab Nebula that they, they get to see all that. I don't do anything except pat Don on the back and say, nice job, man, thanks for coming out. Um, so you can partner with different societies like that. We do an archaeology based activity where we dump a little bump of sand and I buy some replica arrowheads and throw them in the sand and the kids dig it up. Uh, now I happen to have a bunch of stone tools and things that I can use for sort of like the earlier part of the activity. Hey, here's, you know, you want to hold a 4,000 year old axe. That's cool. Go ahead. You can take that. But not everybody has that, right? But again, archaeology clubs and societies are, are everywhere. So partnerships are huge to this. If you can partner with local organizations, whether it be your DNR or Division of Wildlife or um, Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, you can get great resources there and possibly even people to come out and do a program for you where you're just going to hand off and let a pro take over and uh, just, you know, educate again more education and that part is less labor intensive uh, compared to some of the other stuff you know we also teach outdoor skills like archery and fishing that's pretty intensive uh, labor wise but you know you can go one way or the other and get as crazy as you want with it and these some of these curriculums are set by state and national agencies the uh, the learn to fish program we did was called passport to fishing i believe that's a that's a federal program that's administered by states so you might be able to find out from your local dnr that there's somebody who will come to your campground and teach fishing now i don't know how you know how that's going to work now um but it's an outdoor activity you can stay distant from one another so you you might still be able to get help with those things mm -hmm. um so yeah, one way or the other, there's there's lots of different ways you can go with it, either more labor or less labor intensive. I do it just because I, it sure is a nice break for me. It's something I enjoy doing and uh, gets me out of the office for a while. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the whole idea of the outreach programs is actually something that I've written down as being a great um, thing for campgrounds that don't have the resources or the manpower to do things. So things like the local Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, I mean, because we're on the road, we can't necessarily be a in the Boy Scouts having two boys, but uh, what if we could and places that we go could help us earn certain badges by having like the outreach program and the local chapter coming and doing certain activities. Um, it could be great uh, marketing for the businesses that are in that town to bring a little outreach there and then they go out into the town and, and learn more about it that way. So that's actually, that's wonderful, especially for the places that don't have a lot of nature around. That's something that they can offer if they can't make the scavenger hunts and things like that. I mean, Greg, Greg we need to get Toby on the phone. We need to get Toby on the phone because we need to have a Scouts of KOA program nationwide. Yes. And then I, badges at different KOAs for different like that. Yes. Um, can we call Toby? Yeah, I'm, I've got her right here. Hold on. Right. Are you there? Is that easy? Yeah. 
Actually, at this campground, we're at Neil, the owner came because we've been here for a month and he's, he's seen that I have my two boys with me and he actually invited us to go with him to a Boy Scout event at a lake and go fishing. And they're not technically Boy Scouts, but they were just being nice. And so my boys got to go and do that. And that was awesome for them. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I guess uh, we did have a question on Facebook from um, Jennifer Pollock. I guess, the, Brittany, this was for you. She wanted to know um, how you go about looking for campgrounds. Um, she said, what, you know, what keywords do you use? Do you look on a web browser? Um, just as a campground owner, she wants to know, um, I guess. Okay, yep. So I look, uh, like I said before, two different things. So for my month when I'm stationary with the boys, I look for uh, like proximity to interstate for safety reasons. I look for amenities like a pool is kind of a big deal, um, depending on the weather, if it's heated or not heated. I look for laundry. Um, and then I'm looking for field trips that are available within a less than two hours away that I can take the kids to on a Saturday or Sunday. So I try to find, you know, at least three or four of them while I'm there. Um, and then I use apps on my phone. So I think I have, uh, I use like Campendia, RV Parky. Uh, I kind of have between, I have Park Advisor, um, I have things to try to find. My, my process is kind of crazy. I'm using like six different things at one time, like Google Maps in my app. And this, I check reviews and I check aerial shot. I'm looking at all of that, but I'm really, um, I'm looking for safety. I'm looking for things to do and to make sure the campground has the things that I need, like the, the laundry and the pool and a playground and a dog park. Those are, you know, my big thing. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, do you, and I imagine you look for places that have pictures because you want to see it before you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I have to see it. <laughs> so I think, I think the one thing we can take away from this, and Kimberly will probably agree with me, is that you have to pay attention to everywhere that your campground is listed because people are looking at 10 different places before they decide to book. And so by including this information on your website, by including it in your social posting, by making sure that it's available wherever people are looking, you have a greater chance of attracting people like Brittany. Yeah. Yeah. But I think and, uh, too what's important about what she said is really just understanding the customer buying process. You yeah. know, when somebody is searching for an area, they're going to look at six different apps. They're gonna look at reviews, they're gonna to go to every single you know, campground's website, they're gonna to go to every social page. It is a multi touch point process for her to make a final decision as to where she's going to stay. So you know, when you, when you think about your, your marketing strategy in general, it, it's, you have to take that into consideration and, you know, you, you have to attack every single one of those avenues um, in, in hopes that, you know, Brittany chooses your campground. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, I guess on the, you know, back to the virtual, I guess, education part, um, uh, I guess I was, it's just, uh, when you're looking at the nature stuff, I guess, um, you know, some of the campground owners might have liability issues about taking like campers out and doing some of these activities. I guess, does that ever cross your mind, Greg? Is that like a big issue or are you not, you know, are you concerned about that when you do some of these activities? Not it, generally, no. I mean, the, the worst thing that maybe happens to somebody is they get, um, you know, stuck by a thorn or something, or we, we've never really had anything happen. Most of our trails are, are pretty tame. We don't have any like rough terrain or anything. Um, invariably, when we do the creek walk, somebody's gonna come close to a slip and fall or maybe slip and fall, the rocks can be slick, but it's, you know, it's ankle deep water and it, it's just, most of our stuff is really easy. It's not, um, it's not strenuous at all. So now it's, it's not been something that we've had problems with yet. Thank you for asking and bringing it up, Ben. Well, I know we covered that. We covered that Ben on the insurance webinar. Remember when I brought up the bear running through on fire? Yeah. Like More bear. Chris Hippel and Irene, I think, was on the same show, right? Uh, or it was just Chris Hippel, anyway. But we were, we talked about that. There's very few things that you need to worry about liability standpoint-wise from regular activities in your campground. I think. 
was involves like physical destruction of buildings and so I think parks are pretty safe to to take them out and, and experience those things. Yep, that's how I understand it as well. I wasn't interested, you know, my wife and I have a, a huge field guide of edible mushrooms. And, you know, they have like, uh, uh, because, you know, we like to mushroom hunt. And um, they have like the skull and crossbones by the ones that you can't eat that, you know, aren't, aren't good for you. But you had mentioned doing like an edibles thing, you know, how do you, uh, you know, potentially keep campers from getting into like something they shouldn't be eating, I guess. So to be honest, I, I educate them. Most of the edibles I show them, they taste terrible. <laughs> so it's, and, and the ones that I show them that are, uh, that are delicious, right, are easy. Like it's, it's a black raspberry. All right, there's nothing else that looks like a black raspberry. Here's where they're growing. If you want to eat some, go for it. Otherwise, you know, if you've ever tasted a wild carrot, um, it's like chewing on tree bark that smells like <laughs> carrot. Uh, you know, so it's, it's not, um, and we don't, we don't have a lot of folks here that would go out and forage, but I do absolutely preface everything with, you know, hey, this is what this plan is. Is it edible? Sure. Is it a great idea? I have no idea because I don't <laughs> eat it regularly. I don't recommend that you do either, and anybody could be allergic to it. But, you know, here it is. If you want to try it now while we're standing here, go for it. You know, it's your decision. And uh, most folks just kind of sniff stuff and let it go. But occasionally you get your adventurous ones that are like, they're going to throw that thing right in their mouth. And yeah, it's kind of awesome to watch. It's, that wild carrot one is, is great. It is it's like, it really is like tree bark that smells like carrots. It's terrible. Yeah, I've eaten some wild carrots. They're not very good. They're not great, right? Those for the animals. Yeah. So. <laughs> So, um, uh, uh, it, but it's, it's interesting um, that, you know, everybody, I think, you know, we talk about all these activities for the industry where they have like jump pads and the water parks and people are investing those kind of amenities, but they also want the nature experience. And it's just interesting to hear some of the stuff that you do, Greg, and some of the stuff that um, you're talking about at the, at the parks you work with, Kimberly, you know, you can have all that fancy stuff, but there's also value in having all of this nature related um, education things as well that, that cost a lot less than maybe a jump pad or a, or, or a full water park. So. Well, here's, here's the thing too, right? Like, I mean, you can utilize some of the things that these parks already have that aren't nature amenities like jump pads and playgrounds to teach things probably like math, right? Yeah. If you really put some thought into it, it require more thinking than a nature guide or a tree guide or things like that. But there are ways that you could do that too to, to take even more advantage of some of the virtual learning, I think. Absolutely. There's a lot of physics involved when you got a little kid on that jump pad and somebody three times the size jumps on and sends him into the stratosphere. Yeah, absolutely. So another thing to think about that's kind of a big deal with us road schooler is books. So nobody wants to put extra weight in their camper carrying out books and from someone who has a middle schooler and a kindergartner. Um, when we are stationary for the month, most libraries that we go to do temporary card but for those times when we are not at a place for that long um books could be a big deal but campgrounds could offer some kind of um like in and out process because with good quality books not your romance for the older ladies and things like that but if i had good quality young adult books that i could get you one while we're there for a week and he can put one back that he has already read that um came from the last campground as opposed to taking up space in the camper that would be amazing so. Yeah, and I mean, we see those pop, I know in the community I live in, I think there's four or five different like little libraries that people have built. Um, I forget what they call them. Um, but you know, you can even do something like that at your park where um, you know, campers are bringing in books to share with people through the little library. It's kind of like a birdhouse that they put books yeah. in. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, that's a really neat idea. I mean, there's no reason why, you know, potentially maybe you couldn't provide some books for your campers um, at the park. So I had, I had a book exchange at my park and I didn't ever have to put anything. I mean, it, there was, a, it was a constant rotation, always new stuff. It was, it was really well received. Also, if you had room for an extra room that's kind of by the office that could be an escape kind of room to go and do schooling because we all like to get out of our campers so have the space to do all this nature stuff 
if you had a homeschool room, it could have some decorations like from the dollar store, a map and the ABCs and things like that. That could just be, let's go get out the camper to school in there today. Um, mm -hmm. That had books at the library there or something like that. Puzzles. I have two huge age gaps. If you had puzzles in there for my little so I could teach my old his math, then, you know, that could be really good too. Great ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of good ideas. I think, uh, you know, once you really explore some of the ideas, there's a lot of different ways you can do things, and it's not a one size fits all model. So it's definitely adaptable to whatever size of park you have. Um, you know, if you are more of a park that doesn't have a lot of nature stuff, there's still ways for you to engage um, with uh, campers and find educational stuff to do, I think. So, um, so great stuff. Uh, um, I think uh, Bailey, Margaret just mentioned in our chat box that there's an app called Agents of Discovery that, um, uh, uh, is funded by public agencies it's a, that you can use. Um, you can do a road trip to some of these places that it mentions in the app and you can do educational stuff through the app. So that might be worth looking at as well. Yeah. So, um, if you're a park owner. Uh, I liked what Greg said about the partnerships because I think you know we've written a bunch of articles for the magazine on partnerships, creating those partnerships and there are some great uh, part, uh, campgrounds out there. Campground, you know, there are some great owners out there that have taken advantage of those partnerships and offer some really amazing stuff. And it would be great to see more park owners take advantage of some of these partnerships they have in their communities. Um, you know, just because there's a lot of different things you can do if you're involved with the community. You know, from RV repair services you could provide to the educational stuff. Um, you know, it's just being a part of the community. I guess, Greg, do you work, you know, what are some of the places that you work with specifically at your park? Um, so the, the Ohio Division of Wildlife, for sure. I, I've worked with them uh, quite a bit. They, they do everything from loan me education materials, like um, uh, I get a box full of binoculars for my bird walk, because not everybody comes with binoculars. Um, uh, they have different trunks that they loan out for different subjects. So if I wanted to do education on mammals or, or reptiles, there's a trunk for that. Um, and th this is, you know, specific to my area. So whether or not everybody has this, but uh, my local division of wildlife, um, local park system a little bit, but I, I'm lucky in that I have lots of friends who do this stuff. So I can, par and, my, and my wife is a tremendous help. Um, she helps me on almost every one of my walks. She's here to, to fill in the gaps, which mine are large and hers are small. She's a fantastic educator. So she can really help me out. Um, but the, uh, the things that I would say would be your, your division of wildlife, your local park district. Um, and you know, even if the park district doesn't have necessarily an outreach program that they're gonna come to your place and work with, you might find a naturalist who is not doing programs on a certain day of the week, you know, and they're doing things on weekends, but through the week they're free. And that plays into the things like Brittany was talking about, you know, she's there all week with her boys. Well, folks like her and other homeschoolers, uh, a program through the week when most park owners might not think about it would be really attractive to people that are on the road and trying to keep their kids occupied and into their education take them out with a, a professional naturalist and, uh, you know, let that person just take the load off you. It's, a, it's low uh, uh, labor for you. So park district, um, that's really about it. And then the clubs, uh, I think the clubs are another great way to go because like I say, those guys are generally really into um, showing off what they know and their stuff, you know, the archeologists are, are happy to show you their pieces and um, the astronomers. I think that stuff really plays well. And I think it plays well for a campground. Um, you know, as long as you have a fairly rural setting. Again, uh, I'm not talking to folks that are right next to the highway, just outside the city. This stuff's not going to work as well for them, but there's still plenty of stuff they could do. They just need to, to kind of tailor it to their location. Yeah, yeah. I guess Kimberly, <laughs> Kimberly, sorry, with the parks that you work with, do a lot of them have partnerships as well with other local agent, agencies and groups? Yeah, all of them do. And, and I think, I think, Greg, you hit it on the head, like it, partnerships within your community are so important. Not only does it 
kind of enhance the guest experience for you to be able to refer them to other businesses in the area when they come to stay with you. Um, you know, you, you kind of become their tour guide haphazardly, but that speaks a lot for you as the campground owner, being able to, um, you know, tell them where to go. But then I, I think also, you know, just from a marketing perspective, when a customer is trying to decide where to stay, you know, having all of those partnerships listed on your website, all of the local museums and, you know, whether it's, you know, the reptile park, whatever is in your area that can enhance the camping experience um, is, is also beneficial in, in helping that buying decision. Yeah, that cuts my planning time in half. If they already tell me where I can take a field trip, great. Do you have helped me so much? <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, it, I've, I've learned over the years in, in doing, doing this for campground owners um, and then also advising is, you know, businesses are so willing to participate. You know, they, it, it's, it's kind of free marketing for them. It gets their name out there. It gives them additional exposure. Um, and, you know, you're helping your guests in turn. So a lot of people have come to me and they're, they're fearful, you know, what do I say? How do I start the conversation? And, you know, it, nine times out of 10, almost 10 times out of 10, I, I haven't met a business owner that said no yet to, you know, participating and partnering in some way, um, whether it's, even if it's just providing, um, you know, information for them to give out to their campers, that in itself is helpful. To, to somebody looking and planning their trip. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's just about reaching out. I mean, I guess the worst somebody could tell you is no. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you, at least you tried. So, um, uh, uh, well, I, I, you know, I'm out of my huge list of topics that I had. Brian, did you have anything else you wanted to mention? You always run out right at noon, man. It's like you plan that. Well, no, I, I just don't, I mean, I guess I could come up with some off the wall stuff we could talk about. Go for it. Let's see it. More bear. Off the wall thing you can come up with right now. Off the top of your head. Tarantula. Uh, uh, I don't have a lot. I'm not a good. Well, tarantula's up for you, Kara. You said to diversify from bears, so. I know, I know. I love it. The tarantulas are my favorite. I <laughs> know. My new favorite. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's been a great discussion about what parks can do on the education side. Um, I know, uh, you know, people are going to be looking for those types of activities. And I think it's great for the park owners because maybe there's a way this fall to potentially boost their fall business and see more people during the week. I guess, uh, Greg, just from the park owner perspective, what have you seen as far as what, are your, what does your fall look like as far as bookings? Right now, it's really strong. Um, I'm hoping it continues that way, but it, it, it looks really good. Um, even through August, which generally gets pretty quiet for us because folks are any extra income, you know, of course, it's not going to the camping trip. We're buying school supplies and clothes and everybody's getting ready to go back uh, in this part of Ohio. Anyway, it's, it's also fair season. So, um, you know, it gets slow, but we, we've been strong through August, which uh, again is normally quiet. Um, so people are definitely staying on the road and just the surge in outdoor recreation right now is, is definitely keeping the, the booking strong. Yeah, we're fingers crossed it continues. Now I know some of it will depend on whether the parents can come along for some, you know, some of the parents are still working from home, but some have also had to return um, back home, uh, you know, back to work. Um, so maybe that'll limit some of the travel capability of some of the families too, I guess. It, it may, but we're seeing so many teleworkers that it's, um, it's kind of staying up even through the, sorry about that, even through the week, uh, because so many more people are, are, you know, not stuck, I shouldn't say, but so many more people are being told to continue teleworking uh, as the pandemic continues. I've seen a lot of families postpone their vacations to the fall in anticipation of less crowds. So, you know, I, I think parks are going to naturally see that, you know, you know, stronger business in past years, um, you know, with the mindset of, oh, we'll wait till the fall to take our vacation. It won't be as busy. So if really from a marketing standpoint, if you were a campground owner who was trying to attract either homeschoolers, which are a little bit easier, but the people who are 
maybe virtual learning, maybe not. Nobody really knows. It seems to flip back and forth in every city and every country from week to week. Um, but when there's some clarity, how would you suggest from a marketing standpoint they reach these people? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm usually a, a fan of a multi-pronged approach. So you always want to start with your existing customers. So email marketing is really effective in that sense of reaching out to your customers, anybody that stayed with you previously, and let them know what you have planned for the fall. Um, I think social media is also important, whether you are just posting on a regular basis and talking about all of those things um, that you're doing in the fall, um, or, you know, just talking up some of the things that you already have on site that you may not have talked about over the summer, um, especially anything nature driven, um, because I've, you know, not everybody's going to be swimming, not everybody has a heated pool. So talking about those things that you have on site um, in your social media marketing, um, just to reiterate, um, you can also obviously run targeted ads. That's also a really great way to reach um, a customer base that wouldn't normally be staying with you, but that might be interested in what you have to offer. You can really um, kind of target based on, you know, things they like to do or, or specific areas to really attract some new customers. Um, and I think too, one, one of the things we're seeing is, you know, with so many um, new people to the camping industry, so they were previously hoteliers and that's how they traveled and now they're getting into camping. Um, you know, I, I had some campgrounds that, you know, I guess the preconceived expectation is they're used to all of the amenities that you would have at a hotel. So they're expecting the pool, they're expecting the fitness center, but it, it's actually kind of been opposite of that. And we've gotten a lot of positive response because they're really just excited to give their kids a different experience than what you would get in a hotel. So really talking up, you know, all of the natural things you have on your property, all of the nature driven um, amenities, um, it is really attractive to that converting customer. So while you may not think it's important to share and you may take it, not, not take it for granted, but just don't think of it as an amenity, share it because um, there's a lot of new people at a camping and it's going to be interesting to them because it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I, yeah, I think we talked, uh, you know, a few weeks ago about some of the new people that are camping and I mean, there's just a floods of them. And as a, you know, for marketing, you've got to let these people know what you have because a lot of them don't have experience camping and they don't know, you know, what's at a park or how to do things. And it's important to kind of uh, tell them what you have and then kind of when they get to the park, kind of just teach them a little bit as to, you know, how things, how things work at the campground, I guess, just to make their experience a, a really positive one. So... Um, yeah, you, you almost have an opportunity to sort of start your brand awareness over again right now because there is such a huge population of new people to camping and all of these people have never heard of you before. So just just the brand awareness component, I'm here, this is what I have to offer is so critical right now. Um, you know, and, and even, you know, working in blog content can be really helpful for helping explain, you know, different things you have on site and different things you have in the area. All of that is really searchable for somebody who is planning. <laughs> um, you know, if they can find an article about your campground and what you have in the area, that can really be helpful as well. You know, I've been hearing this year from campground owners. I think I've heard more than in the past few years. Of the campground owners are getting comments from like local people. They're like, I didn't even know you were here. And uh, it's just kind of really surprising. It's like, well, you've been there for 20 plus years, but people didn't know you were there. You know, I guess where, where's your marketing been at? Well, that's I guess. it. They just need to hire Kimberly. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> but no, it, you know, it is really, it is really interesting. Um, you know, at, as we've taken a look at, you know, a lot of the initiatives we had in place for some of our campgrounds, some of our ad spend, and where we were targeting our ads, that's really changed, and we are seeing. Um, you know, a lot of more nearcations, staycations, whatever you want to call it. And so we've really had to revisit, you know, where we're targeting our ads and where we're targeting our messaging. So, you know, if you are spending ad dollars right now and you are 
working with somebody marketing that is something you definitely want to make sure you bring up with them because um, you know your your core demographic is likely changing. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, it's changing. So, um, well, well, that's great information. So, I mean, it, it's just a, it's just times are changing so rapidly now, and uh, park owners are trying to sort it all out. And uh, it's great to have um, all this information out there so that they can just kind of uh, see what works for them. So. Um, I guess uh, I, you know, I don't have anything else on my end. Does anybody else want to comment with anything else, or are we good, Brian? What are you asking me for? I'm not in charge. You got any more tarantula stories you want to tell us? I can always come up with tarantula stories. I mean, because <laughs> you got to be aware of all this stuff, Ben. It's just like uh, Kimberly was saying with brand awareness, right? First of all, <laughs> when you got all these new RVers coming to your campground, you have to hide the tarantulas and scorpions and snakes and bears and. Yeah, the first thing they experience when they come, <laughs> I mean, we're in trouble in the RV industry, so we got to have all these parts in board. Well, I think it was a really great discussion, and I think one of the important things we talked about, too, is that, you know, we don't need to have, you know, if you don't have the, the quality internet, you can still do stuff, you know, you don't have, we're not just focused on virtual, giving, you know, that Wi-Fi for the virtual Learners, you're looking at ways to get them away from the computers and, you know, educate themselves at the park and have activities to do. So I think that was really good. I know I talked with a lot of campground owners this week that were like, well, we're scared to do anything educational or cater to the virtual, you know, market to the virtual learners because our Wi-Fi isn't, isn't, isn't the best. So well, when I think that, Ben, we had a conversation about it, right? Like at some point you need to upgrade your, and I don't know, I know there are rare parks where you can't get it because the telecommunications company or the cable company doesn't have anything to upgrade. But those are few and far between and they're getting rarer as we continue forward through time, right? And so I, I think the big opportunity here for marketing is yes, there are homeschoolers and road schoolers who are always going to be here. But I think the immediate benefit here is these virtual learners and what happens within your specific district or city. And so those people are going to need the Wi-Fi, I think, because they're still gonna have a curriculum in their schools. and so. If, if there's any time to invest in it, hopefully this is just one more catalyst. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Well, uh, thanks everyone for coming on, Kimberly and Brittany and Greg. Uh, appreciate your time. And uh, Kara, it was nice to see you. Brian, it was good to see you again. And uh, I think we had a really great discussion. Hopefully, hopefully everyone uh, learned something from it. Uh, at least they should know to stay away from tarantulas. So. Uh, <laughs> Always learning something. They're completely right. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching. Have a good rest of your week. Bye. Bye, Ben. Thank you. Bye. -bye.